Good afternoon. I am Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and today the committee will hear a suite of bills that will help New York City reduce its greenhouse gases and meet its mandate. Said just three years ago by Local Law 66 of 2014 to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent by the year 2050. Three years ago, I marched in the People's Climate March with 200,000 other, other New Yorkers who want to see a future that is not imperiled by climate change. Uh, to get to that future, we must reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. The United States, which has 5 percent of the world's population, emits 22 percent of the greenhouse ga worldwide ga greenhouse gas emissions. Within the United States, fossil fuel combustion accounts for 94 percent of CO2 emissions. New York City is responsible for 1 percent of the greenhouse gases in the entire nation. Yet New York City must continue to grow because living in cities is more sustainable, but we must grow responsibly. That means meeting our commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Our promise to future generations is more significant now when the federal government has ceased to lead us in the right direction. New York has to lead. The only sustainable way to the future is to reduce and transition away from the use of fossil fuels. These bills will help us accomplish that goal. Intro 1629, the Stretch Energy Code would change the process of updating the Model Energy Code by requiring that the administration for the next two periodic revisions send the Council recommendations designed to either conform the New York, New York Energy Conservation Code to the Stretch Energy Code created by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, or two, if NYSERDA stops updating its Stretch Energy Code, adopt recommendations designed to make the New York Energy Conservation Code at least 20 percent more stringent than the state's energy code. Intro 1630 would require the administration to produce a plan for encouraging city employees to increase their solar usage that is designed to facilitate bulk purchasing of solar energy by city employees. Intro 1639 would require the administration to create a plan for encouraging property owners and business owners in business improvement districts bid to increase their solar energy usage. This proposed local law is also intended to facilitate the bulk purchasing of solar energy grid systems in each bid. Intro 1644 would require the administration to establish an office known as the Green Project Accelerator. The accelerator would, would, turn, would in turn establish a program to ensure expedited review and approval of applications and other documents submitted to DOB in connection with Green Projects. Intro 1632 would require building owners to disclose energy efficiency grade or score to prospective buyers or leasees of a such building or a space which in such building and would require, further require that such grade be posted in larger buildings. Finally, intro 1651 would improve energy efficiency in city buildings by requiring DCAS to pilot a three-year program to allow real-time monitoring of energy usage and heat loss in city properties managed by DCAS with a view towards reducing energy waste. Improving the energy code, facilitating bulk purchases of solar energy, expediting green projects, and improving energy efficiency in city buildings are just some of the incremental steps we need to, 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 do, to reduce our greenhouse gases 80 percent by 2050, to improve our air quality and to reduce respiratory disease, and to leave a sustainable future for subsequent generations. Uh, now I want to hear from, I want to recognize that we have uh, Councilmember Eric Ulrich, I know has to leave early to attend a, a, a staff member's parents' wake, so uh, please pass along our condolences and thank you for being here, Eric. Uh, we also have the, the sponsor of uh, 1644, Donovan Richards, who I'll turn the floor over, and then uh, Councilmember uh, Dan Gorodnik, who as well will give an opening statement on his bill. You want me to make a statement first? Oh, no. Yeah, go. You, you have an opening statement on your bill? Sure. All righty. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm proud to sponsor. Uh, intro 1644, which would establish a program to ensure expedited review and approval of applications uh, that are submitted to the Department of Buildings in connection with green projects. Uh, as uh, the chairman said, we are living in a day and age where we see federal cuts coming down the line. Uh, we know there are individuals who don't even believe in, client, in, in climate change. Um, so my bill in particular focuses on ensuring that we can expedite the process. And we hear a lot of complaints uh, when individuals go to the Department of Buildings to, uh, in particular, get 
uh, solar panels put up. They, they, they seem to come back to the office and say, well, we're running into a lot of red tape. So really uh, creating a system, an ecosystem within the Department of Buildings that uh, can ensure that uh, when homeowners or, biz or business owners or uh, building owners go to the Department of Buildings, they can get uh, ad adequate responses is, is an important step in ensuring that we can uh, address climate change in an expedited, accelerated fashion. So I look forward to working with the admin uh, on this, and I will now turn it over to Councilmember, uh, oh, back to the Chairman. Councilmember Member Gorodnik uh, for intro 1632, if you have an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I am very pleased to sponsor intro 1632 uh, with you and Councilmember Johnson. Uh, this bill would require that uh, building owners obtain building energy efficiency scores and to disclose that information when they're selling the buildings uh, or when they're leasing entire buildings. Owners of individual spaces like condo or co-op apartments would also need to disclose the building's efficiency score based on information provided to them by the building. Property owners are already expected in New York to disclose a great deal of information when working with a prospective buyer. Square footage, structural integrity, known toxins or hazards, and other data points. Disclosure of energy use, too, should be customary in our real estate market in recognition of the tremendous impact that our buildings can have on the environment. About three quarters of city emissions come from our buildings. Property owners should work toward making their buildings environmentally efficient, and buyers should re reward that effort when it comes to purchasing real estate. Recent decisions made by the federal government to withdraw our support from the Paris Climate Accord have called our country's efforts to fight climate change, a very real and dangerous phenomenon, into grave question. It's clear that we cannot rely on the leadership in Washington to head off a global catastrophe. Mayor de Blasio, along with mayors, governors, and business leaders across the country, is appropriately committed to following the principles of the accord, but each and every one of us can also take actions to reduce our contribution to climate change. Making the environmental impact of a building a factor for consideration in the selling process is an important way to help property owners and buyers engage meaningfully with their carbon footprint, allowing both parties to work toward a more sustainable future. This legislation will help us set our sights higher toward greener building standards, and I look forward to hearing testimony on this bill today. And again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your leadership on this uh, issue and on so many others, so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gorodnik. Uh, at this time, I want to recognize also that uh, Councilmember Roy Lansman has joined us. Thank you for being here, uh, Councilman Lansman, and also want to thank the Sergeant at Arms for their quick turnaround uh, in this room. So thank you for all of your hard work to get us going so quickly. With that, I will turn it over to the administration for your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Constantinides and members of the committee. I am John Lee. Deputy Director for Buildings and Energy Efficiency. John, can, I'm sorry, one second. I have oh, Maris, oh, yeah, we, right. we got to do the formalities. So let me, uh... <laughs> can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear? Um, can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear in a f or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. All right. Take two. <laughs> take two. Uh, good afternoon. I am John Lee, Deputy Director for Buildings and Energy Efficiency at the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, or MOS. And I am a registered architect in the state of New York. I'm joined today by Gina Bokra, Chief Sustainability Officer of the New York City Department of Buildings, or DOB, and Anthony Fiore, Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, or DCAS. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on these seven introduced bills, introductions 1629, 1630, 1632, 1637, 1639, 1644 and 1651. Climate change is perhaps the toughest challenge New York City will face in the coming decades. Rising sea levels, increasing temperatures and precipitation, and the likelihood of more frequent and intense storms threaten our neighborhoods and infrastructure while exacerbating many underlying social inequities. While President Trump continues to abdicate American leadership on climate change, Cities across the country are taking up the moral imperative of pursuing action on climate change. On June 2nd, 2017, Mayor de Blasio signed Executive Order Number 26 
committing New York City to uphold the principles and goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Through the executive order, the mayor has directed city agencies to work with MOS, our national and global climate network partners, and other leading cities to develop further greenhouse gas or GHG reduction plans and actions that are consistent with the Paris Agreement to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The mayor and MOS applaud Speaker Mark Viverito, Council Members Constantinides, Kumbo, Gorodnik, Johnson, Ku, Richards, and the City Council for their leadership on climate change and energy policy issues as demonstrated by the introduction of these bills. We are grateful for your partnership in our effort to reduce the city's GHG emissions. 68% of citywide GHG emissions come from energy consumed in our buildings. The administration is working to reach the dual goals of reducing emissions from buildings 30% by the year 2025 and reducing citywide emissions 80% from 2005 levels by 2050. To reach these goals, in 2015, MOS convened a year-long technical working group comprised of stakeholders from New York City's real estate industry, including building owners and managers, architects, engineers, unions, affordable housing interests, and environmental advocates. The work of this group forms the basis for some of the bills before us today, building on the city's legacy of energy efficiency and green buildings policies. Therefore, the administration is pleased to testify in general support of today's introductory bills. With the City Council's engagement on climate change policy, our city is in a strong position to address this challenge effectively. Please allow me to discuss each of these bills. We have identified areas where we should work together to further strengthen these bills. Introduction 1629 would require more stringent energy efficiency construction requirements in the New York City Energy Code than the New York State Energy Code and by 2025 establishes very low energy use intensity design requirements for new and substantially reconstructed large buildings. We strongly support the adoption of advanced energy efficiency construction standards as an incremental strategy to improve building energy efficiency and reduce GHG emissions to levels necessary to achieve the city's GHG reduction goals. The mayor's office, DOB, and key industry advisors are currently working with the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, on the development of the 2018 New York State Stretch Code an alternative energy code based on the New York State Energy Conservation Construction Code that will realize at least 20% energy reduction in projected energy consumption. Future additions of the New York Stretch Code will be designed to achieve additional improvements over the base New York State Energy Code, and those will be evaluated for potential adoption by DOB's Code Revision Committee. The administration agrees with the City Council that the real estate, architecture, engineering, and construction industries must be subjected to energy performance design target requirements for new building projects and substantial renovations for covered buildings, those are 25,000 square feet and larger, as part of an overall market transformation of services and industries able to deliver very low energy consuming buildings. The buildings that are constructed today will continue to exist throughout this century and the GHG impacts are most economically mitigated at the time of first construction. Regulations do drive the industry towards better performance levels and very low energy performance from buildings that will be built in the future is a critical component of the city's GHG reduction objectives. The bill establishes a specific design performance targets with a ramp of eight years for the industry to transition to new standards. That said, the city is supportive of quicker transition to lower energy design targets, which will require a close partnership with the council and industry. There are a few technical issues with the bill as introduced that we have identified and trust that council is open to working together to address those issues. Furthermore, the bill as introduced authorizes the mayor's office to propose amendments to the energy code directly to the city council if the state authority fails to develop a model stretch code. However, such authority is within the purview of the commissioner of the Department of Buildings. We do not believe it is the intent of the city council to remove such authority from the commissioner, and we will work together to ensure that the language accurately reflects the already legislative protocols for energy code revisions. Introduction 1632 would require an owner of any building when selling or leasing the building to disclose an energy asset score and for the owner of a large building to publicly display an energy efficiency grade. 
Awareness of energy utilization should be a critical factor in the transactional choices made in businesses every day, and we strongly support the intent of this bill. An energy asset score disclosed at the time of sale or lease and a publicly disclosed energy efficiency grading scheme have the power to convey meaningful information on a complex topic in a simple and accessible way. However, we have concerns over the structure of the publicly disclosed energy efficiency grade and the timing of the energy asset score disclosures. First, with respect to the structure of the energy efficiency grade, the bill as introduced indexes the grade against the reported source energy use intensity, or EUI, of the building. This is a measure of all fuel consumption in the building, electricity, natural gas, fuel oil, and district steam, over an entire calendar year on a per square foot of floor area basis. We must point out that EUI is not an indicator of efficiency of a building. For example, a building that remains empty for an entire year would have a very low EUI and score an A under the proposed scheme, whereas a densely occupied building that operates 24 hours a day, while perhaps very efficient, would exhibit a very high EUI and potentially a very poor grade. We look forward to working with the council to determine a grading scheme appropriate for New York City buildings. Second, with respect to the timing of the requirement for the energy asset score, the deadline of July 1, 2018 does not afford sufficient time for the professionals who would be providing the energy asset score services to evaluate every building covered by the bill. We propose the council consider a later compliance date to provide the industry with enough time to meet the bill requirements. And we look forward to working with the city council on this vital legislation. Introductions 1630 and 1639 would require the city to submit plans for encouraging city employees and business improvement districts, or BIDs, to aggregate demand for solar energy systems in order to reduce the purchase price of these systems and increase citywide adoption of solar energy. While we applaud this council's intent to expand solar electricity generation and utilization in the city to the greatest extent possible, the requirements of the bills may not be necessary to legislate. The city presently offers Solarize NYC, a core component of our strategy to expand access to reliable and affordable solar power for all New Yorkers. Through the program, the city provides up to $20,000 in funding to as many as eight New York City communities each year to reduce market barriers for solar energy, attracting more solar energy companies to conduct business in the city, and increasing installed solar capacity throughout New York City. Solarize NYC stimulates demand for the services of local solar installers and reduces customer acquisition costs, and therefore the total purchase price, by aggregating customers. This program is already available to assist communities and networks of New Yorkers, which could potentially include city employees living in the five boroughs and members of bids so that they may benefit from the reduced prices from collective purchasing and the implementation of solar energy. As such, legislation to extend the benefits of bulk purchasing and reduced prices to city employees and members of bids would be unnecessary. We look forward to working with the City Council to work with the existing Solarize NYC program and framework to bring solar energy to more New Yorkers. Introduction 1637 would establish a New York City Energy Policy Task Force and create by 2019 a long-term energy plan for the city and require that plan to be updated every four years thereafter. This requirement is duplicative of the existing obligations of the mayor's office as stipulated in Chapter 1, Section 20 of the City Charter to convene a Sustainability Advisory Board, or SAB, and deliver to the City Council every four years a long-term sustainability plan that includes energy policy as a component of the current 1NYC plan. Introduction 1644 would establish a green project accelerator program within the Department of Buildings. While we certainly agree with the intent of this bill to remove administrative barriers to renewable electricity, DOB continues to make improvements to permit processes and investments into personnel and information technology that advance the city's clean energy goals. The requirements of Introduction 1644, while laudable, are already being implemented at DOB and thus unnecessary to legislate. Most permit applications for jobs that would qualify as, quote, green projects, unquote, as contemplated by this bill, would be submitted to DOB under the permit classification of Alteration Type 2, or Alt 2. 
An Alt 2 permit can be obtained from the department in a single day, including an Alt 2 permit to install a sol solar photovoltaic electric generating system on a rooftop. As of April of this year, 110 megawatts of solar capacity have been installed, an 81% increase since just 2015. This pace is a result of market demand, government incentive, and notably, the streamlining of procedures within the DOB. Introduction 1651 will require real-time monitoring of energy use and heat loss in city buildings with weekly public reporting of some data in addition to annual reports by DCAS for three years. The city is a strong supporter of and has an active program for real-time electricity monitoring. Technologies for monitoring heat loss on a broad scale in real time, on the other hand, are undefined, and the standards, the benefits, and the utility of such monitoring have not been established in the industry. Today, more than 250 city facilities currently have real-time electricity monitoring capability, representing about 30% of total city government demand. While we support the intent of this legislation, we do not believe that this bill is needed for the program to continue and to grow. Furthermore, weekly public reporting requirements would take resources and time away from working directly with the city agencies that use this information in facility management and will not be particularly useful to the general public. We understand the need to share this data and maintain transparency in government operations. We welcome a conversation with the city council about how to make this information available to the public in a meaningful and useful manner. Please allow me to reiterate the administration's support of the city's council's bold efforts to reduce New York City GHG emissions through these introductions. Working together, we are confident that we can strengthen these bills to help us achieve our goals of cutting emissions 80% by 2050 and upholding our part to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Uh, I want to begin the conversation with saying that I, too, uh, appreciate our, com our partnership and looking forward to getting where we need to go. I will say that, um, based on your testimony, um, you know, we need to codify things. I understand there are certain agencies doing certain things, and I appreciate that, and I'm excited about that, but uh, in a, you know, we will not be here forever. Uh, in the, either in the agencies or in the city council. So I think codifying things and making sure that we stay on the right track has a lot of merit. So I will frame that discussion uh, moving forward. So just saying that, just pull it out of your testament that DOB is doing well on a particular piece right now is, is wonderful. I, I am glad that they are and I'm excited about that. But at the same token, I want to keep that going forward regardless of who's in office, right? So, and regarding who's sitting at DOB and, and who's sitting in MOS, and so I think we need to be mindful of that as well. So that said, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, sorry, my. Do we expect it to be difficult for buildings to comply with a stretch energy code that requires us to go 20% uh, greater efficiency? With any change in the code, whether it's uh, advanced code over our regular revision cycle, there is going to be some difficulty. You know, the regulations change, but we are also in a re uh, legislative environment where the regulations have to change every three years following the state code cycle. There are many arguments for and against more stringent standards, and some buildings will be impacted in ways different than other buildings. And so we can expect that there will be some change, and at least in the near term, with every code revision cycle, there is a ramp period in which the industry does have to grow, in a sense, accustomed to the standards and change business practices in order to accommodate the regulations and to comply with the regulations. All right, so what, do you, what benefits for building owners, tenants in the city generally would be uh, of adopting the stretch energy code? Thank you. I was about to get to that. Um, <laughs> while we recognize that there uh, are likely to be near-term increases in costs, these costs should level out as the standards and the practices become normalized across the industry. But uh, thank you again for raising that. There is a long-term benefit to property owners and developers for reduced energy consumption and the savings that come from the investments that are made up front to energy efficiency and improving energy performance. 
And how much energy would, this, would be saved citywide? How much emissions would be avoided or reduced if we were to adopt it? Uh, a stretch energy code as compared to the base energy code? That wholly depends on the rate of construction activity that we see going forward. And so we have certain projections based on the, our own uh, anticipation of level of growth and, uh, and construction activity throughout the city. I should note that with respect to new construction, our projections out to 2050 represent that new construction greenhouse gas emissions represent only about 9% of the overall uh, citywide emissions. This is because we live in a built-out city. But that doesn't mean that that 9% doesn't matter. And to the ex extent that we can reduce that 9% emissions growth to zero would certainly help our objectives to reaching 2050, and so this must be part of that calculation. 20% improvement in the next iteration of the energy code is not the answer, but it is an incremental step towards that solution and the necessary step in order to gear our industry for, for better buildings and better energy performance. So this is going to be, this 9% would help us get towards the 80 by 50 goal? Absolutely. Every percentage counts. And then what other states or municipalities have adopted a stretch energy code? The state of Massachusetts has already made a stretch code available to their jurisdictions, and uh, don't hold me to this account, but last I remember, at least 10 uh, individual jurisdictions within the state of Massachusetts have taken on their state energy code as their, uh, as their local energy code, and uh, California as well has uh, made uh, even more aggressive stances towards uh, requiring net zero uh, buildings by 2030. Oh, thank you. And as Gina pointed out, State of Washington has also uh, picked up a state uh, stress energy code. So we, we can figure it out, right? <laughs> I'm wholly confident that we can. Now, moving on to 1651, and I know I, I don't want to monopolize. I know I have my colleagues who are here to ask questions as well about relating to their bills. Uh, how, you said that city-owned buildings, about 30 percent, are currently in the demand response program? That's correct. And uh, Explain the details of this program. What are we measuring? How are we doing it? Yeah, so about 250 buildings have been installed with real-time um, monitoring. Uh, that's been part of the demand response program thus far. Um, and so we use th that metering to curtail uh, load during times of constraint on the grid that help prevent brownouts and blackouts across, across the city. Um, and also saves money. Uh, the, the facilities are reimbursed for those avoided costs from, from the utilities, and, and they can use those for additional um, energy efficiency projects or otherwise. Um, we're also starting a program to expand that from only being used during times of grid constraint to all the time, right? So now we have the data available. We've, we're putting in systems to do the data analytics that will allow facility managers and operators to use that information in real time to curtail um, their energy usage, regardless of whether there's a constraint um, on the system or not. Uh, and we've had some early successes with, with that thus far. So the, the, the real benefits are that they're able to save money and then use those savings to do other energy efficiency upgrades on the building, correct? Well, I, I think the real benefit is being able to optimize their existing um, systems in order to be as most efficient as they can be. So, <clears throat> you know, of course, we're investing a lot of money in updating um, equipment uh, to increase efficiency, but mm -hmm. we can't do that everywhere at once. And so being able to optimize existing systems to get the most out of them um, is extremely important as well, and I think that's the, the major benefit. What's the major drawback for us not doing more than the, the 250? Um, we have plans to do more than, than the 250. We, we have a target of about 750, which would represent about 80% of the energy use by city uh, buildings. Um, and so I think you know, that represents a, a nice coverage of, of all buildings in optimizing existing systems. Is there any downside for them to be part of this program, or? Um, no, the, I think you get to a point where there, there perhaps may be um, diminishing returns, right? So if it's a small building that's not using much, or it's a type of building that has equipment that really can't 
um, be adjusted, um, then having that, that data available um, wouldn't be helpful. And I, I'd just like to say it's not just putting the hardware in place. It's training the facility folks to be able to use that data. It's having the software available to do data analytics and demonstrate you know, how we can optimize existing equipment to make improvements. So putting the equipment in is one component, but th I think even more important is training folks to, to use that and then the oversight to make sure that it is being used and we're, we're seeing um, outcome-based results from that. All right, this time I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Councilmember Lansman. Council Member Lansman and then Councilmember Richards for questions. And I'll come back. Thank you, good afternoon. I have a, a relatively um, simple question which gets to what I've been told is the heart of uh, the opposition from the, the, the real estate community. And I, the way these hearings work is you know, you testify and then someone else testifies and there's not that opportunity for, for dialogue. So I wanna read you what I understand will either be the testimony or, or the legislative memorandum from uh, Rebney, the real estate board, regarding this issue of um, EUIs, EUIs, um, the uh, energy use uh, intensity uh, indicator. And I want to get your, your response to what Rebney's uh, view is. Rebney is deeply concerned over the use of energy use intensity EUI in the bills mentioned. EUI is a flawed metric because it does not take into account occupant density and space use. Rather, is it, a, it is a simple ratio that divides a building's total annual energy consumption by its total gross floor area. Generally, a low EUI signifies good energy performance. Buildings with a low concentration of users, residents and or workers, will tend to have lower EUI than buildings with a high concentration of users, but are actually less efficient. But New York City's building stock is much more diverse and complex than that. Buildings with open bullpen style floor plans to accommodate a concentration of traders with multiple computer screens have a relatively high EUI, even when the building itself is rated as platinum LEED certified. Tenants' energy use patterns are, pr are a primary driver in a building's total energy consumption and of often outside of the building owner's control, which the bills below significantly target. A new metric needs to be developed that accounts for energy consumed, square footage of the space, where that energy is consumed, number of full-time employees or residents using energy, number of hours worked by these employees, in addition to the economic value of the work performed. So in light of that, uh, can you respond and, and tell us your view on using EUI as, as a metric? Absolutely, and uh, if I may take your quote of the Rebney letter of context, I'm pleased to hear that Rebney did not object to having an efficiency grade at all, and was rather objecting to the metric itself. As stated in my testimony, EUI is not a measure of efficiency in and of itself. It's a powerful metric, and, but it's a self-reflective metric in a sense. For an individual building owner, in order for them to understand where they are and where they would like to go, it provides a baseline and understanding, and if they can make improvements or they observe uh, uh, continuing deficiencies or uh, changes in operation, this does ref get reflected in the EUI. And over time, say on a year-over-year -year basis, a building owner is able to understand where they were the year before or where they were two years ago and where they are now in terms of overall energy consumption in their buildings. It's also a powerful tool for the city to understand in the aggregate across all the buildings how we are performing as a city on a per square foot basis. We first need a baseline understanding of where we were as the law was passed uh, in 2009 and became effective in 2010. <coughs> We suddenly knew way more about our buildings than we've ever understood before and are able to construct effective policies, much like the bills that we have before us today, to get us towards energy reduction and greenhouse gas reduction goals. It is not a measure of efficiency. The, the number itself, KBTU per square foot per year, does not account for occupant density. 
It does not account necessarily for the kinds of tenants that you have. And as I suggested in my own testimony here, that we should be working together with council to uncover what are the effective metrics to convey the right kind of information about the efficiency of buildings. It absolutely has to be done that we should be grading these buildings. We should be providing meaningful information, not only to building owners, to the public at large, but we need to have the right metric to represent that information. So would you agree that if we're going to require buildings to meet um, a, a certain metric or if we're going to grade buildings based on a certain metric, maybe there's still some, some work that needs to be done to, to get to that right metric? I, I understand the value in having some benchmark, but if we're talking about requiring buildings to meet certain standards or grading buildings based on certain standards or any kind of um, compulsory regulatory action regarding certain standards that we, we still need to, to find what that right metric is? For the purpose of the discussion on this bill, with respect to the efficiency grade, I would agree with that statement. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Councilor Lansman, Councilmember Richards. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, so I wanted to speak on intro 1644. Uh, so I think based on your testimony, you're saying the Department of Buildings has someone that does this sort of work already, that expedites work. Uh, so can you just speak to the process on if I wanted to install some solar energy and I come to the Department of Buildings, how quickly is my permit moved? Thank you. We do have um, a unit that focuses on solar. Um, in 2015, uh, the average wait time to get a solar job approved was 45 days. So for many projects... Wait, wait, wait. so 45, 45 days? 45 days. So from the start of the process to the end, 45 days? Through their first review. Through, say that again? Through the first review. Okay. So not even to approval. Since that time, the department has invested resources to reduce that wait time significantly. And in 2016, we changed the policy so that small installations that have low risk, mostly one and two family type installations, could be taken through a process called professional certification of objections or professional certification of the application. And this uh, transferred the responsibility for code compliance to rely mo mainly on the re uh, design professional that was submitting the application. This reduced the wait time for that first review to 3.6 days. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't mean to laugh at Department <laughs> of Buildings. Um, so now... Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me I can go to the Department of Buildings today. I sit up for this one. I think I need some popcorn. And I can get something done in three days? <laughs> Actually, today you can get it done in less than a day. So in 2017... Really? The solar So, so why solar don't the Department of Buildings get back to my office within 24 hours or <laughs> Maybe you need to call someone differently at the <laughs> office. <laughs> wow. That's historic if, if it's true. How many people in this unit? Uh, I don't know the number of applicants, but it has significantly so you, reduced. So how can you say it's a significant increase if you don't know the number sitting here? So does anyone have that answer? There, I'm sorry, I don't know the number of applicants. So do we know if it's one person? Is it five people? Can it's, you give a it's guesstimate? Maybe two dozen. So 24 people, you're saying? I'm, I'm guessing. I think my math is right, right? Yes. So 12 times two. And where is this office located? Um, it's at the hub. At a hub, mm -hmm. and that hub is located uh, at one center, or sorry, eighty center. So a homeowner would go into one center street and submit their design professional. Their so design professional, a, a and they can walk out of there with a permit. With they a can yes. submit it from a computer and do it online. Hmm. All righty. Uh, and, and do you have stats? So how many people have applied? Can you give us that number? Um, the number has increased um, by hundreds compared to 2016 and 2015. We've seen almost 1,000% growth in the last four years. So I apologize, I don't have the exact number of applications right in front of me, but it's hundreds of applications per year that are now processed. And this is all, so now let's get away from just solar. So geothermal, any other 
so all of them are treated the same, all of the... This is just solar applications. So just solar. Mm -hmm. um, so why not geothermal and other newer technologies that are evolving as well? Right. What about wind? Wind as well? At this time, we don't track those uh, specific types of on-site renewable energy, but we do have... With and why not? I, we've um, not had the ability to do so in the biz system, but now we're replacing biz with DOB now, as you're probably aware, and that will give us the ability in the future to track more of those types of applications. Okay. And which agencies are involved in the permitting process? Uh, FDNY also has to work with us sometimes. Um, some solar applications don't meet the fire code and need a variance, so they work closely with us. Um, if it's a geothermal, we might engage um, DEP, uh, DOT. It depends on the type of application that we're looking at. And do they have people stationed in their offices as well, or do you have to call, or is there a particular person in, within those agencies you coordinate We call coordinate a particular with unit well? and coordinate with them. The rooftop unit at FDNY is who we often work with. And how many people are in that unit? I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. And I say that because we have a bill, because there's always a lot of discrepancies around using um, uh, solar energy on uh, one family home, so areas like Southeast Queens who want to see mm -hmm. more of an abundance of this type of technology, we often hear from homeowners that they have a hard time getting through to you. They have a hard time getting through to FDNY as well. So um, what would you say to that? Can you speak to why uh, when individuals come to our offices, they tend to take more than three days in getting an installation? or an approval signed off for? If it's recent, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that it's taking them that long. Um, if it's from two years ago, then that was expected. We have a strong partnership with CUNY um, and their solar program, which is a, a partnership between the mayor's office, EDC, and CUNY. There is a solar ombudsman who is in our DOB office once a week. And they are um, a representative of the industry. Uh, and they're, they would, they're from CUNY. They are Sorry, from CUNY. You. And they would also be able to represent a homeowner if they had questions. They are a resource that we um, often direct uh, building owners or homeowners to because they're an advocate for, for the building owner. And how many homeowners would you think have this sort of information? What sort of outreach has the Department of Buildings done to... Uh, give homeowners this sort of knowledge because if I went to mm -hmm. my district today I'm sure many people don't know CUNY actually exists and <laughs> and I think we and, and no offense to CUNY I'm not I don't want to take away mm -hmm. from the work that they've done matter of fact I think we held a hearing actually there uh, two years ago where we spoke of this same issue um, but I find it hard to believe that people know that they should call CUNY uh, in the case of, 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 of assistance we have so, a, a website. And so the, the question is, and I, I know we also had another bill, which we can go back to creating an ombudsman within a Department of Buildings. Why are we still just leaving everything in CUNY's hands? We've not had funding for an ombudsman at the Department of Buildings. You said you don't have funding? We have not had funding. We've requested funding from OMB for that position okay. two years in a row, and we're not given it. OMB here? <laughs> okay. Um, so we look forward to, to having this conversation with OMB on why uh, we can't achieve this. Um, lastly, so you said the goal of the bill, bill is laudable. Uh, so why uh, do we see resistance to this bill amongst the other bills? Uh, what is the difficulty in codifying this? There probably is not an inherent difficulty in codifying. I suppose, in a sense, I might personally be a legislative purist and would rather not see clutter in our laws on uh, procedures and protocols that are already in place. I can appreciate the Chair's comments that we probably won't be here in 30, 50, 100 years from now, and so there are merits to codifying. And I would certainly welcome the opportunity to work with the Council to make sure that we legislate in with a level of precision that affords security for our intents in the long term and legislate where it is necessary. Wow, that was a good political answer. Um, all righty. 
So I will now digress a little bit, but I, I just want to put back out there that there are ways, would you agree that there are ways we can strengthen this system and make it a better system for everyone in New York City, um, especially as the chairman spoke of, what we are facing at the federal level, we should be doing all we can. I think the mayor was in Miami speaking of the great work we need to do to make sure New York City is prepared for climate change. So I'm hoping that the, that the administration is really going to uh, take this seriously, not saying you're not, but really move these bills forward. Because at the end of the day, we're not sitting here for no reason. We're sitting here to ensure that uh, New York City can be protected and that we can really reduce carbon emissions with that great goal we set of 80 percent by 2050. So I'm hoping we can find a medium here, uh, and this is about protecting the future of our city, and I'm hoping that we can meet that goal together. Absolutely. Let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Richards. And, uh, I follow up quickly on one of his inquiries uh, on the FDNY. How are we doing in allowing for electronic submission of those variances? Are we still, I know we have a bill to get that done. Are we any closer to getting that done or are we still requiring to bring all that paperwork down to MetroTech personally? Uh, I don't think I am in the position here to answer on behalf of the fire department and can we get back to you and in the form later with the answer to that question? Okay, great. I, I'm hoping that we can move to electronic submission soon. Um, then going moving forward on the bid on intro 1639, uh, what partnerships have we had with uh, local bid associations on environmental initiatives thus far? I think it's a little bit premature to um, you know, publicly state the exact kind of commitments we've been able to uh, confer with bids. Um, I will um, probably suffice to say that this is an ample opportunity. Uh, to have this sort of customer aggregation to bring uh, the benefits of solar energy to organizations such as BIDS. So here again, applaud the, uh, the Council's recognition of this opportunity and to put such a bill uh, forward. Uh, uh, as more um, uh, sort of the, I guess you could call it negotiations in a sense with the BIDS come forth, uh, I think we'll be able to speak more openly about that. Are, have we seen any bids voluntarily undertake uh, any renewable energy or energy efficiency, pro energy, efficient, uh, energy efficiency projects thus far? Uh, off the cup, I can't say I can say. Uh, that you think that there are incentives that we could offer to encourage them to do more of these green projects? I would very much like to explore that with you. All right. All right, great. So I will at this time, I think my colleagues have no more questions and I've, I've asked enough and I will continue to ask uh, more later on as we, uh, just quickly, just going back, just very quickly, I'm going to sort of take uh, on this EUI. What do you think is a good, a good unit of measure if EUI is inefficient? Um, where, where do we, because I've heard the argument made to me that we should not move forward on any of these bills, we should have another study to figure out what is the right uh, method of measurement. Is that something we need to go to? What do you think is the right unit of measurement if EUI is not the right way to go? So um, first, uh, to study something is not a, uh, a coy way to defer decision. <laughs> it does, in fact, require some level of study because we want to do something that is appropriate for New York City. Right. If I were to force to produce examples of other metrics that are uh, plausible and perhaps viable for this particular application. The Department of Energy has an Energy Star program. You may have seen it on appliances, like refrigerators and washing mm -hmm. machines. The same Energy Star scoring system is applicable to buildings. And in this case with the Department of Energy, the source EUI is one variable among several variables that produces a one to 100 score. And through our benchmarking program, we already apply the Department of Energy's Energy Star score to eligible buildings under the benchmarking program. And this, that, the, the scoring system relies on a background database of comparable buildings in commercial and multifamily spaces. So there is a sort of uh, baseline, uh, in a manner of speaking, against which to compare comparable buildings. Now, while I wouldn't um, go so far as to say right here that we should pick up Energy Star, I do produce that as an example of an alternate metric to EUI that does account for other conditions with the buildings besides just the raw consumption of, of energy and fuels. 
All right, so that, I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation. I definitely want to figure out what that right metric is. Great, and Energy Star, and glad to hear that the Department of Energy is still doing. I'm, I'm assuming they came up with this uh, this this idea before the current administration. Yes. <laughs> Is that an additional statement that you want to make, or is that just a lunch order? Or what? No, he's just telling me I'm doing a great job. <laughs> With that, I'll let this panel go. Thank you for your, for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you. Chair? All right, next up, we have Donna, Donna DiCostanza, who knows this entity well from uh, our, our NRDC. Uh, Chris uh, Halfnight uh, from Urban Green Council. Abby Brown from Environmental Defense Fund and Amanda Gabay from 350.org and Citizens Climate Lobby. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Uh, Chair <laughs> Constantinides and honorable council members, thank you for having us and allowing us to have the opportunity to um, give our testimony on these bills. My name is Abby Brown, and I'm the Clean Energy Project Manager for Environmental Defense Fund's New York Clean Energy Program. I respectfully submit the following testimony in support of all of the bills that we're discussing today. I won't list them by number. Environmental Defense Fund, or EDF, is a non-for-profit, non-partisan, international environmental organization with headquarters in New York City, with 2 million members worldwide, more than 35,000 of which are New York City residents. We work to advocate, uh, excuse me, we work to advance market-based policy to address the world's greatest environmental challenges. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to read my entire testimony. I would urge you to please read the written testimony, but I, I think given the size of the package of bills that we're discussing and the crowd, we should um, keep the time moving. Um, uh, as they stand, these bills cover many of the challenges the city face, faces, all of which need to be addressed. However, we think they could go farther, that we can go farther. There is a fine line between creating legislation as quickly as we need it and rushing into policies that will lock us into ineffective action. In several of the bills, which I will discuss in a moment, it is somewhat unclear what additional benefit they provide um, to the plans and processes already in place. At this point, it may be most effective to increase the efficiency of existing procedures rather than create additional ones. We respectfully urge the City Council to take more time to consider a cohesive package of bills that include energy efficiency and more renewable energies than just solar. <laughs> EDF supports the efforts made by the Council, and the following critique is intended to make these bills the best they can be. Let me discuss in brief a few specific bills that hold the most potential. And I think in this we will echo some of the sentiments heard by the Administration previously. Uh, both numbers 1629 and 1627 seem to duplicate procedures already in existence. And instead of creating new codes, we should find synergies within existing processes to improve the work already being done. A multi-stakeholder task force devoted to long-term energy planning is valuable, and we support the codification of such a requirement into city law. Opportunities to find common ground between this requirement and existing efforts would be beneficial to all. Intro number 1639 would require the city to create a plan to encourage bids to increase solar energy use. The city certainly should be motivating businesses to use solar energy, but why stop there? Why not encourage other types of renewable energy, such as wind or, geo or geothermal, as well as energy efficiency? The bids can be a useful mechanism for incentivizing broader use of renewable energy, and they can and should go farther than what is required in this bill. Intro number 1644, which creates the Green Project Accelerator, contains a very concerning omission. While the initiative would cover renewable energy projects and distributed energy resource projects, which is admirable, by the definition given in the bill, it would not cover energy efficiency projects. This is troubling, as energy efficiency is critical in reaching the city's 80 by 50 goal. Buildings account for roughly 70 percent of citywide carbon emissions, of which the majority comes from heating and cooling systems. In the city's own Roadmap to 80 by 50 report, energy efficiency is listed as one of the most significant reasons why carbon emissions have been reduced thus far and a key measure for continued carbon reduction. Leaving energy efficiency out of this bill is both confusing and worrisome. 
We should not focus only on making sure buildings use clean energy, but that they — but we should also make sure that they use less energy to begin with. Without these two efforts working in tandem, the 80 by 50 goal will be increasingly difficult to reach. <laughs> EDF supports the efforts made by the Council to make our city greener and cleaner, and these bills are meant to advance those necessary efforts. However, we think the Council could benefit from taking more time to engage with both the environmental community and other stakeholders regarding these pieces of legislation, and to consider whether some of these bills duplicate already existing processes within city government. We submit our questions and concerns to ensure that this legislation will provide the strongest benefits once it passes. And EDF welcomes the opportunity to work with the Council to accomplish these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. Good afternoon, Chair Constantinides and the committee. I'm Chris Halfnight, Policy Manager at Urban Green Council, whose mission is to transform New York City buildings for a sustainable future. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comments today. Urban Green strongly supports the intent of these bills to advance energy efficiency and green power citywide. But we also feel that these proposals need refinement and additional input from stakeholders to move forward. More specifically, for Intro 1629, we agree the city's energy code should be more stringent than the national model codes, but we feel the requirements need stakeholder input to set targets that are ambitious yet achievable. They should be based on a consistent existing reference code or codes and address all building types, including small buildings, and should include a prescriptive path for the many buildings that don't use energy modeling. For intro 1632 on energy disclosure, we support finding an effective way to expand transparency for energy efficiency scores from Local Law 84 benchmarking. Building owners have had many years of familiarity with the metric, and the track record is clear. 6% energy savings over three years across thousands of benchmarked buildings. While we also support the concept of an asset rating based on building features, asset ratings are largely untested here, and we feel it's premature to jump to requiring disclosure. Instead, we suggest using Local Law 87 audit data to provide an asset score privately to building owners and the city with a study and recommendations to follow. We also support the development of an energy rating tool for small buildings. For Intro 1637, Urban Green supports long-term long energy planning informed by stakeholders, and we suggest three additional topics. Assessing progress towards 80 by 50, improving alignment between state and city, and the potential impact on electric and gas grids. And for intro 1644, we support a green project accelerator <coughs> with two recommendations. Extend the scope beyond on-site generation to include other green strategies, like energy and water efficiency, resilience, and also setting specific and ambitious criteria for those green projects, such as Passive House, Lead Gold, or Net Zero. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, um, members of the committee. My name is Donna DiCostanzo. I'm Director of Northeast Energy and Sustainable Communities at the Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRDC. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important package of legislation before you today, which NRDC supports. NRDC has a long history of working in New York City on issues related to energy efficiency and renewable energy, including working extensively with the Council and the Administration on the landmark Greener Greater Buildings Plan. In this era of complete abrogation of climate leadership at the federal level and an assault on the most fundamental clean energy and climate programs, New York City is an important leader among the local jurisdictions, committing to filling the federal vacuum and charting the direction to a climate-friendly future. As you know, buildings in New York City account for about two-thirds of the total citywide carbon emissions. Therefore, to reach our 80 by 50 in interim greenhouse gas reduction goals, we will have to continue the great strides that have been made since the passage of Greener Greater. The legislation before you today further expands and strengthens New York's first-in-the-nation programs to reduce energy use in buildings, increase deployment of solar, and facilitate clean energy and green projects. And in so doing, the bills will not only play a critical role in achieving the city's 80 by 50 goal, but will result in significant job creation, lower energy costs for consumers, fewer emissions of harmful pollutants, and increased reliability of our electric grid. 
Intro number 1629, the adoption of a stretch code will ensure new buildings and major renovations are significantly contributing to our low carbon goals. Low energy intensity requirements will also bring New York's midsize and large new buildings to the cutting edge of efficiency and create a built environment that is a sustainable model well into the future. We believe that all buildings, large and small, need to be part of the plan to achieve our carbon goals and recommend that the city develop a framework to also address buildings below 25,000 square feet. Intro number 1632, we support increasing transparency regarding a building's energy performance given the important information it provides to prospective purchasers and tenants, as well as its positive impact on encouraging building owners to implement energy upgrades and to move the market toward more efficient buildings. We also strongly support the development of asset scores for buildings to provide a comprehensive picture of energy performance for building owners, including regarding a building's design and energy systems. We believe, again, that information regarding building energy usage should be accessible regardless of building size. Intro number 1637, institutionalizing the creation of an energy task force and long-term energy plan with a broad range of stakeholder participation resurrects a previous critical New York City Energy Policy Task Force initiative and continues the city's efforts to do robust planning and annual reporting that underpins the implementation of the many initiatives that will get us to our 80 by 50 greenhouse gas reduction goals. In addition to the elements already specified in the bill, we recommend that the plan include steps the city should take to increase clean energy deployment at the state level, as well as ways in which the city will better integrate its clean energy planning efforts and initiatives with those of New York State. Intro number 1630 and 1639, Solarized campaigns for New York City employees in business improvement dis districts will reduce costs, streamline the solar process, and expand, expand the deployment of solar power, helping the city to achieve its 1,000 megawatt citywide solar goal. The council should consider expanding these bills to include electric vehicles and potentially energy efficiency as well. Uh, intro number 1644, creating a green project accelerator will reduce soft costs and expedite important clean energy products projects, building on the important efforts of the New York City Solar Partnership and other initiatives to facilitate increased clean energy deployment. The Council should ensure that the scope of the accelerator includes energy efficiency in addition to renewables projects. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to continuing to work with the city, real estate industry, other key stakeholders to meet our 80 by 50 climate goals, to ensure these bills and others are effective, ambitious, and achievable, and to maintain New York City's important climate leadership role. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, council members. Thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Amanda Gabai. I am here with a lovely group from 350 Brooklyn and uh, Citizens, and Cli Citizens Climate Lobby. That's a tongue twister there. Um, we are volunteer organizations, and we are all here playing hooky from our day jobs. Please do not tell my boss, um, <laughs> because we are excited that you have proposed all of these bills and that you are trying to show climate leadership um, here in New York City. Uh, the New York Times last week recently ran an article that um, about 40 flights were grounded in Nevada um, due to excessive heat. Uh, climate change is not this future thing that happens someday, hundreds and hundreds of years from now, it is starting. Uh, <laughs> storms are becoming more frequent. Many of us lost power during Hurricane Sandy. Um, I think there's this idea that environmentalists just want to hug polar bears uh, and, and cost businesses uh, billions and billions of dollars. And polar bears are great, but you know, we're here because we're scared, um, and this is our planet, and this is our city, and um, we don't want it to be underwater. Um, and it's not too late to do something, and what we're here to do is, is see some action. Um, the federal level, is, we're seeing things go backwards now that we've abandoned the Paris Agreement. Uh, at the state level, we just saw the New York State Legislature uh, legislative session close with almost no action on the environmental side. There were some great environmental bills and they died in committee. Let us not see that happen again here. We are looking to the cities for leadership and at this point, I think the cities are some of our only hope. Um, and we can do better. We can kick the New York State Legislature's butt and <laughs> the city council can show that they can get more done than is happening up in Albany. And we are looking forward to seeing what you guys do. We are so excited to see all these bills that you've proposed. Uh, we love the action that's trying to happen. Maybe some of these bills aren't perfect. So we go, we fix them and we make them better. 
and we move forward. New Yorkers want to see action. We are excited with what we're already seeing happen. We want to see more of it. And um, we understand that this is a marathon, not a sprint. We are taking the long view. We know that some things like building uh, changes in building codes will increase costs up front, but it will promote energy freedom, energy efficiency, and lower costs in the future because the sun shines for free. So um, let's see what you can do. We're looking forward to it. Well, thank you. But we do this here in the council. She, she's got it. She's got it. There you go. You see? But just, you know, just to address uh, all of you, Donna, first, welcome back. <laughs> But uh, all of you, uh, I won't tell your boss. <laughs> Thank you. But we are, are in, all, in all seriousness, um, you know, we are uh, looking to make sure we get the best legislation possible. So I appreciate the critiques. I appreciate the honesty. That we, I mean, we recognize that uh, we are looking for the best metric. Uh, we are looking to figure out the best way to get this done. Uh, we, too, believe that action uh, is the most important thing, and we want to move the city uh, to continue to be the leaders that we are internationally uh, as we see uh, the see Washington taking a huge step back in the wrong direction and uh, putting playing a jazz band to have the soundtrack to the end of the world as he 's doing it. Um, we are going to continue uh, to push back and to be leaders on the environment, so we will most certainly take uh, all the critiques that you 've had and the administration has and, and take those into account, but we will look to move quickly on legislation because we need to act. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate you playing hooky from your day jobs. I appreciate everyone being here today and letting to your voice and all of your strong partnerships. So we will keep moving together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, so our next panel is uh, Lisa DiCapri from the Sierra Club. Buck Moorhead from New York Passive House, uh, Lindsay Klein, uh, she has architectural practice, and Justin Pascone from the American Institute of Architects, AIA. And if there's anyone who wants to testify, because I have one more panel after this left, if anyone who intends to testify, you need to sign up now, pretty much, right at this table with the sergeant in arms. If not, then you are unable to testify. And I don't want that to happen if you took time off from work to be here. So please come up to the table and make sure you testify if that you so choose to do so. All right, then, will you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? You have the pole position. You're, you're right into the end of the table, so there you go. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Lisa DiCaprio. I am a professor of social sciences at NYU, where I teach courses on sustainability. I am also the conservation chair of the Sierra Club New York City Group. The Sierra Club supports city council legislation to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels by switching to renewable forms of energy and increasing the efficiency of our buildings, which are responsible for over 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions in New York City. While the Trump administration is denying the science of climate change, architects and engineers are applying the science of buildings to achieve increasingly ambitious energy efficiency standards. For example, passive house can reduce by up to 90% the energy required to heat and cool conventional buildings. When it is completed this summer, the 26-story residential building on the Cornell Technion campus, designed by Handel Architects, will be the largest and tallest high-rise passive house in the world. I will focus my comments on intro 1629-2017, introduced by a council member and committee chair, Costa Constantinides which requires large new and substantially retrofitted buildings to meet low energy intensity requirements. This bill complements intro 701-2015, the amended version, introduced in 2015 by Council Member Melissa Mark Burrito, Council Speaker Mark Burrito, which mandates that all new city-owned buildings must be designated and 
constructed as low energy intensity buildings. The bill was passed by the City Council and signed into law by Mayor de Blasio on March 28, 2016. I would like to make these four recommendations concerning Intro 1629-2017. One, the effective date should be 2020 instead of 2025. The technical expertise already exists for designing low energy intensity buildings. Moreover, the higher upfront costs of passive house and low energy intensity buildings, typically three to five percent, will diminish as they are mainstreamed and constructed on a large scale. A five-year delay in the implementation of this bill is a missed opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, especially the current construction boom in New York City. To incorporate the social cost of carbon in the text of the bill, this key environmental concept assigns a monetary value to the social cost of climate change impacts caused by carbon pollution, which are now affecting all sectors of the global economy. Precedents for incorporating the social cost of carbon in City Council legislation include Intro 1159-2016 on the installation of solar water heating and thermal energy systems on city-owned buildings, and Intro 609-2015 concerning the installation of geothermal systems on city-owned buildings. The geothermal bill set the social cost of carbon at $128 per metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent with progressively increasing values that reach $142 per metric ton by 2020. To apply the social cost of carbon to a building, we would assign a specific value that is a dollar amount for each metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent that the building does not emit because of its low carbon design. This dollar amount, which could be increased every five years, would be multiplied by the number of years projected for the life of the building. With such a calculation, we can highlight the financial benefits of passive house and low energy intensity buildings from an environmental perspective. My third recommendation is that in the future we would extend the low energy intensity requirement to all new buildings and substantial retrofits in New York City. And my fourth and final recommendation concerns how council members can inform their constituents about various ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Last night, for example, council member Helen Rosenthal, who represents me in the city council, held a clean energy forum about how Upper West Side residents and businesses can switch to renewable forms of energy. The Sierra Club New York City Group co-sponsored this forum, and we encourage all of our council members to organize forums on renewable energy and building efficiencies in their districts. In this way, we will increase public support, including within the real estate industry, for the initiatives required to ensure the future of our city. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next. Oh, sorry. Hi, thank you for, for having us. My name is Buck Moorhead. I'm a, on the Board of Directors of New York Passive House. I'm also speaking on behalf of NYH2O and Damascus Citizens for Sustainability. We applaud the City Council for its support of Intro 1629. As we know, roughly 75% of New York City's greenhouse gas emissions are related to its buildings. Legislation designed to substantially mitigate building emissions through the employment of Passive House strategies in buildings is essential. The low energy targets proposed are being achieved in projects of many types all over the world in many climates. New York City, to its credit, has recognized this and has been developing its own pathway forward, one that acknowledges and respects the dynamics of our economies, our building industries and design professions, and all that makes New York the great city that it is. We at New York Passive House are prepared to assist the council in any manner that may be helpful as a conversation moves forward regarding this legislation. With respect to demonstrating the viability of the target with respect to this legislation, I've distributed three projects for your review. It should be noted that uh, Passive House has been uh, operating globally since 1990. It's been based on uh, uh, strategies that we are using in North America in the, in the mid-70s. Uh, this past spring, there was an international Passive House conference, 1,200 people representing 60 countries, 
80 people from New York attended. Many of the, the several presentations were made by New York City architects around, about projects that they're doing here, here in, in New York City. Uh, the first project that you have is the first primary school in, in the USA that was certified by the Passive House Institute. It's located in, in Hollis, New Hampshire. The second project is a primary school in Germany, also cer certified by the Passive House Institute. This school was c completed in 2004. This is 13 years ago. This stuff has is, is been going on. The third project is an office building in Frankfurt, Germany. Passive House, as is obvious, is, is about more than houses. These projects are cited to help demonstrate what you have already heard today and will continue to hear as we move forward. Very low energy, near passive house, and passive house new buildings and substantial retrofits are being successfully completed both globally, in this country, and in this city. We must be intelligent in the steps we take, provide training and incentives where appropriate. We should challenge our building committee, its developers and builders, its architects and engineers to embrace this new paradigm. Passive house is absolutely that. It is, it is, an essential, is as is essential as making sure that the building structure is adequate and that, w that we keep the rain out. New York City can lead our country in showing the way to this new paradigm. We cannot afford not to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, my name is Justin Pascone. I'm here today on behalf of the New York chapter of the American <clears throat> Institute of Architects. Uh, and our 5,500 architects and associated members. Um, I'm going to respect everyone's time here and read from parts of our testimony, but I encourage you to, to look through it all. Um, our organization at the AIA, we aim to lead, inspire, and educate our members on the design uh, and sustainability in the built environment. We are currently organizing engaging programs that focus on outstanding green buildings, um, current technologies, uh, product research, and sustainable design practices by leading architects from around the world. Uh, we're partaking in a sustained push for initiatives that reduce carbon emissions in the built environment and create healthy spaces for New Yorkers. Uh, to achieve the city's 8 by 50 goals, we realize both the private and public sector uh, must undergo large-scale changes. We are generally supportive of the package of bills you have today before you. Um, in reference to two of them, intro 1629, uh, we're supportive of, of this measure. Um, but in refining the bill, we're suggesting that uh, a prescriptive path as well as a performance path um, that is specific energy saving actions that are measurable be included in the language of the bill to assist and support the many buildings um, that are included. Uh, in addition, the council should consider similar targets uh, for a variety of buildings of different scales and uses uh, beyond those covered in the bill. Uh, with the increased need for hyper efficient buildings, uh, ongoing and expanding local training opportunities for our professional architects, engineers, and contractors is going to be needed. Uh, as part of our core mission, uh, AIA will continue our educational outreach uh, and are committed to working with the council to ensure uh, the professional community is ready to meet the challenges of implementation. Uh, the, on intro 1644, uh, we are supportive of the creation of a green project accelerator. Uh, we do suggest that the definition um, be expanded to cover not only buildings that generate energy on site, but also <laughs> buildings that include uh, hyper efficient design, energy efficiency, uh, water and resource conservation, as well as resiliency elements. Um, the AIA and our members are continue, uh, will continue our commitment to working with the council uh, on these initiatives. Um, we have, um, ex <coughs> we're excited that the council is, is undertaking these bills here and we're willing to work with you on any changes moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. My name is Lindsay Klein. I'm a member of the AIA, and I'm a registered architect to practice in New York State, Massachusetts, and California. I am a LEED certified and have recently become Passive House certified. I would like to point out that many individual architects and engineers <clears throat> have invested a significant amount of professional time and financial resources 
to retool ourselves to meet these goals. And I would like to implore, employ the, implore the real estate community of New York to follow suit. Thank you. Uh, I share your enthusiasm, believe me, believe me. So I, I definitely know where that's coming from. Um, but I want to thank each and every one of you. Um, you know, I, we definitely appreciate the critiques and the recommendations. We are, as I said to the last panel, I, I'll repeat, uh, we are looking to be deliberative and make sure we get this right. Um, but we are looking to move quickly. Uh, so, because we don't have time. Time is our, as I tell my son in the morning as he's getting ready for school, time is not our friend. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, you know we, we don't have the time. Time is not our friend here. Um, you know, climate change is happening. It is real, despite what is Washington is saying, and we need to act quickly. So I, I, we most certainly will be deliberative and make sure we get this right. But we need we will act. So I appreciate um, your time in putting together a good testimony to uh, have suggestions, to have critiques, and we will absolutely take them into account as we move, look to move with the administration to move it forward. Uh, thank you for your time. Okay, so uh, Dan Miner at 350.org. I, I could have sworn I had seen him in the crowd, and now he's here. Uh, Robert Specht and Adrian Espinosa, League of, of uh, Conservation Voters, and Scott Frank, American Council of Engineering Companies. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Members of the uh, council, chairman, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dan Miner. I'm on the steering committee of 350 NYC. My remarks are representing my own opinions. Uh, intro 1639 aims to promote the bulk purchasing of solar energy systems by business improvement districts, which is something that I know about because I worked at Long Island City Partnership, which runs the Long Island City bid, for over 12 years. I was permitted to spend a lot of time on my green interests, which included promoting Con Ed's small business energy efficiency program and the New York City program to paint roofs white, as well as rooftop solar. However, my environmental interests were an anomaly in the business improvement district world. I later did community outreach in the Bronx for NYSERDA's Green Jobs Green New York program, so I have a personal experience of what is often a difficult time promoting a program that's not widely perceived to offer attractive values and incentives. So with regard to 1639, I can say with virtual certainty that the staffs and boards of the city's bids uh, are unlikely to make voluntary efforts to participate in the program unless there are, not, unless there are specific mandates and requirements that bids successfully complete very specific solar projects as part of their required performance. Uh, likewise, um, the bill that encourages city employees to promote solar while laudable may benefit from having sufficient incentives to make it an offer that they find compelling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you. My name is Scott Frank. I'm a licensed professional engineer. I'm also a partner in the engineering firm of Jaros, Baum & Bowles. I'm here today also representing the American Council of Engineering Companies, which consists of the firms and people who design the energy consuming systems of buildings in New York City. I'll paraphrase my testimony in the interest of time. ACC New York is strongly committed 
to the city's 80 by 50 carbon reduction plan, but has concerns with two bills. Intro 1637 calls for the creation of a city, city energy policy task force with the excuse me, participation of many specific categories of industry representatives, but does not, does not require the appointment of people who actually design energy systems, namely professional engineers. We'd respectfully request that that be uh, corrected. With respect to intro 1629, we actually urge the council to table this version and engage with our members and other stakeholders to arrive at an approach that more systematically addresses the following four criteria. One, an approach that is less speculative about the future, regula future regulations and market events and forces that will inevitably change the impact of the requirements of the bill on New York City's building stock. Number two, an approach that carefully and clearly manages the transition from a predictive-based regulatory framework such as we have now to one that is outcome-based and utilizes an EUI metric. And one, to repeat previous testimony, that is not only unit area uh, based. Number three, is purposefully informed by analysis of the potential economic impact, including green jobs creation, relative to the 80 by 50 carbon reduction trajectory. And four, provides market certainty and reduced risk relative to the economic impact of designing, constructing, and operating buildings under these changing regulations. We urge the committee to direct its staff to meet with us and other allied stakeholders in a collaborative process to reframe this bill in detail before it moves forward in the interest of our common goals of making New York City a leader in the area of energy efficiency and carbon reduction. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Adriana, long time no speak. <laughs> yes, thank you. Good morning, or afternoon now, excuse me. My name is Adriana Espinosa. I am the manager of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I'd like to thank Chair Constantinidis for the opportunity to testify here today. New York City has long demonstrated how municipalities can take the lead on climate change by implementing practical, measurable initiatives that keep us on the path to long-term stretch goals. Mayor de Blasio's One NYC plan has taken on even more importance in recent weeks. It is our primary vehicle to make good on our commitment to uphold the Paris Accord, even as leaders in Washington abandon it. The bills before this committee today demonstrate that the City Council recognizes the severe threat posed by a rapidly changing climate, and we commend the sponsors of each of these bills for furthering the conversation on how we get New York City to 80 by 50. We cannot, however, underestimate the complexities of this is these issues and must recognize that smart planning and innovation are needed to develop sustainability policies that create both environmental and economic sustainability. For that reason, we must ensure goals laid out in these bills are reinforced by meaningful input from all stakeholders, robust investment, and a clear implementation plan. Through my testimony today, we, I hope to highlight areas where we can work together to strengthen and improve these ambitious measures. Intro 1629. The League is in favor of adopting a more stringent energy code than federal and state model codes. NYSERDA already produces a voluntary stretch code, as mentioned earlier today. Intro 1629 takes that code even further. While New York LCV supports the bill's intent, we recommend refining the energy targets and building, requir and building requirements laid out in the legislation based on stakeholder input. Intro 1630 and 1639. As the field of renewable energy is still rapidly evolving, we must remain open to emerging technologies. Introductions 1630 and 1639 seek to green energy generation, but New York LCV believes we may limit ourselves by choosing only to promote the bulk purchasing of solar energy over other options available now or in the future. Intro 1632. Not only are the technologies themselves still evolving, but so too are the metrics used to measure their impact. Although NYLCV supports disclosure of buildings' energy performance at point of sale, there is not a consensus, as we saw play out here today, there is not a consensus among stakeholders on the best metric to use. New York LCV supports the goals of intro 1632, and we believe disclosure at point of sale could help spur market demand for energy efficient buildings. We should, however, study and carefully deliberate the best metrics to use and the best processes for disclosing them before making a blanket mandate. 
intro 1644. New York LCV is strongly in favor of a green project accelerator. We recognize the significant economic benefits to streamlining the per permitting process for green projects. As currently written, however, intro 1644 is limited in the types of eligible green projects, focusing mainly on on-site generation. Under its current definition, pa passive house, for example, would not be eligible. The green project accelerator should be open to a much wider range of green strategies, including energy efficiency, water efficiency, and resilience projects. While we support the intent of this bill, we strongly urge the committee to revisit the definition of green project and expand it to maximize our emissions reductions. Intro 1651. The bill lays out the groundwork for tracking real-time energy use and heat loss in city buildings, but leaves us with many unanswered questions. Who will be responsible for the monitoring produce and producing of weekly reports? Who will be looking at and using the weekly reports? And how is a sophisticated real-time data collection going to help us reduce emissions? And finally, what is the capacity for city agencies to take on this new workload? We strongly believe in the power of data to drive changes in both policies and behavior. Yet similarly to our comments on 1632, we want to ensure that we're collecting the right data and utilizing it effectively. What's clear here is that action is needing on, needed on climate change, and the bills heard today represent ambitious strategies. We look forward to working with all stakeholders to refine the details and clarify feasibility so that, we, so that these proposals can become successful laws that other cities around the country and around the world can model. I'd like to thank Chair, Consta, uh, Chair Constantinides and the entire Committee on the Environmental Protection for the leadership on sustainability over the years and look forward to working with you all closely <coughs> moving forward. Thank you. Thank you all of you. And, and I, you know, we are definitely looking at the metric. We are definitely looking to make sure we get it right. Um, if EUI is not the right metric, we're really uh, looking to have a good conversation to find what the right metric is. And but we need, you know, we will look to move quickly. So we absolutely will engage all stakeholders, including the league, uh, <laughs> ACEC, uh, 350.org, and, and individuals who have experience in the various fields. And we'll continue to look to uh, get this right. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. So uh, Andreas uh, Benzing from New York Passive House. Alex uh, Bernstein, uh, Daniel Carpen, and Robert Specht. I had said his name before, if he's here. Gentlemen, would you please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? All right, so, uh, sir, right there on the end, what, what is your name? You are? Yeah, that's you. <laughs> what, what's your name again? Speak into the microphone, turn on the microphone on. Bob Schneck. Yep, you were called. All right, great. You can, you can start there. So, sounds good. Let's, let's do it. Okay. My name is Bob Schneck, and I'm a member of Community Board 1. I am fully in support of Intro Bill 1629 with one major concern. As a resident of Battery Park City, I experience a sense of urgency with the slow pace of governmental change and public forgetfulness against the painful harm of hurricanes and heat. We have all witnessed a remarkable building spree as a new generation of highly energy inefficient skyscrapers were built and continue to be built until uh, 1629 begins to come into effect. We will live with the consequence of their inefficiencies for the next 75 years. We have tens of thousands of buildings to, to retrofit, yet no smart grid to connect them to. It has been said that we have the equivalent of Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabian wind reserves just off our Atlantic shore, but the governor has only recently begun to dabble with that possibility. Is it too much to
to demand that the most aggressive and innovative city in the world be aggressively innovative. <laughs> Climate is an issue that needs to be addressed in the immediate present, well before we experience the, ne the next devastating storm surge or irreversible dog days of impossible heat and humidity. Mayor Bill de Blasio called climate change the challenge of our generation. Yet the public is barely responsive to this issue and certain groups are actively opposed. If energy windmills seem in the future, job economics are in the present. Bill 1629 is a call to action and a five-year opportunity to prove that low energy targets are 100% practical for the developers, the owners, and residents, for the builders, and for the economy. Now is New York City's time to wake up the people and turn the environmental ch challenge into a public opportunity. Thank you. Yep, you're up next. Yep. Thank you, Chair and uh, committee, uh, Council Member, for the opportunity, opportunity to uh, testify in support of Bill Number 1629. My name is Andreas Benzing. I'm an architect, teacher, community board five member, and I testify in my position as president of New York Passive House. New York City is committing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. Buildings are responsible for the overwhelming share of emissions and low energy passive house building is the most effective solution to this challenge. Climate change is a risk, but it can be the opportunity of our uh, generation. New York City is one of the world's leader in real estate, architectural and engineering firms, skilled labor, financial institutions and research facilities. We are poised to develop the passive house solutions of the future. New York City has extraordinary cap capabilities as an economic engine for sustainability to lead in the U.S. and the world. The market for low, pa low energy passive buildings is growing fast with 3 million square feet under construction or in design. New construction projects are happening around the city, such as the tallest passive house in the world by Cornell Tech, and large-scale passive house projects such, such as a Grand Concourse development Met Haven in the Bronx or the East 11th Street development in Harlem. A low energy passive building is a reliable and economical approach to New York City's sustainable future and passive house level metrics like EUI and heating and cooling load and air tightness have been built and proven from the ver varied locations such as China and uh, the UK. The board, of, uh, the board of Directors of New York Passive House fully support the goal of uh, Bill 1629, and we look forward to working with you to pass this important bill into law. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Daniel Carpen, K-A-R-P-E-N. I am a professional engineer in private practice. My practice is based in Huntington, New York. My comments are going to be related to introductory 1629. The date of 2025 is totally unrealistic. Change it to 2020. The critical mass for implementing very efficient buildings is here in New York City. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Passive House Academy, Passive House New York City held its conference. 500 or 700 people attended. We have the ability to do it. At the present time, we're constructing about 60,000 new apartments a year. If we were to move the date to 2020 instead of 2015, 2025, we would have 300,000 more apartment buildings that would be more energy efficient. The passive house criteria are a lot easier and to understand than the present ICC Energy Conservation Code, which is highly prescriptive. The one advantage of the ICC code is that it's very good with regard to installed refrigeration equipment in supermarkets, delis, and other food processing and handling facilities. Uh, now, with regard to uh, 
Introduction 1632 in relation to the disclosure of building's energy performance at the time of sale or lease. The question is, is the energy use of data per square foot usable? Yes, it is. You just have to say what type of building it's for, for example, office building, large office building, small office building, residence, and also include within it, uh, within the, the, the date of construction of the building. I have some data in my files that is Northeast Solar Energy, Sustainable Energy Association put together an article. And the surprising thing is that the buildings built before 1920 in New York City are the most energy efficient buildings in our building stock, believe it or not. It's hard to believe, but it's true. The recent uh, taking of some of the Brooklyn row houses and converting them to passive standard has been done using present technology, although it's costly, it works. 310 Union Street, from what I understand, is a passive house, retrofitted. You also have to remember that if you're doing this, you better close up the leaks between your house and the next one next to it. Uh, essentially, even in 10 degree weather, the temperature inside the building is 62 to 68 degrees without a heating system, which is comfortable. I live in a semi-passive house in Huntington, New York, a mid-century modern that I retrofitted the best I could, but I find I still have to turn the heat on if the temperature is below 25 degrees in my kitchen. Uh, now, the other thing I want to tell you is that there's another law we been mentioned, and that was Local Law 87. Local Law 87 only scratches the surface of energy efficiency in the present building stock. What I've done is I've taken Local 87, I've updated it and changed it with my red, red hash marks. I'm going to give the chairman a copy of this. The biggest problem with Local Law 87 is its failure to really look at steam heated buildings and making them more efficient. It ignores the fact that, for example, Local Law 87 says if you have a, a steam line more than three inches of in, in diameter, you must insulate it. But if the steam line is only two and a half inches in diameter, Mr. Landlord or Mr. O building Owner doesn't have to do squat. It is very, very superficial. Doesn't, affect, doesn't address the steam pipe knocking problem to keep people up at night because the steam pipes knock. Why are they bang and knock? Primary reason is, is because the boiler is oversized, sometimes by a factor of 20. It's amazing to me that the buildings department recently does not require one to put on, the, uh, on, the, on a boiler application the, the uh, actual usage of fuel by the building and to downsize the system to make it more energy efficient. I'm working right now with an owner of a small hotel in the east side we have taken a 2 million BTU boiler, taken it out, replaced by a 350,000 BTU boiler, gotten rid of all the oversized radiators, and the building energy use is being reduced 40, 50 percent. The boiler room used to be at 100 degrees because the pipes didn't have any insulation. I wanted them insulated with three inches of pipe insulation. The boiler room is now 50 degrees, and the heat all goes upstairs. Moreover, the boiler runs continuously flat out in the, in the winter months, doesn't shut down, so the, so the losses between firing cycles are totally eliminated. So I'm going to give you a copy of Local 87 as I rewrote it, and you have some more work to do. Always like more work to do. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, Some reading for the summer. Here's a question right? for you. Do government regulations create jobs or do government regulations destroy jobs? I think, we, I think we're in the, creating, in the business of creating jobs. But That's correct. Here's a good <laughs> question for Donald Trump at a news conference. Donald Trump, can you name a government regulation that has created jobs? Uh, wait, I, I, I could go all day. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. We could go all day on that one. Thank you. My name is Alex Bernstein. I'm with Bernstein Real Estate, uh, located in uh, Manhattan. Um, 
We're a 90-year-old company. We've heard, a, a, by the way, we've heard a lot from not-for-profits and architects and academics, but we haven't heard from builders, and uh, that's what I am. So we are uh, committed to our neighborhood, committed to New York City, and committed to the globe, and we're in support of uh, 1629, uh, and we're building a 23-story passive house today. We're doing that. So we broke ground last week, and um, we're very proud of that. Um, we feel it's obviously the right thing to do uh, and that it does not add material costs beyond 5% of some soft costs and a few uh, additional hard costs, but it's, it's very feasible. That's, uh, it's, it's a very feasible operation. The problem, and, and unfortunately, is that virtually none of my peers know what Passive House is. Um, so, you know, having architects drive the conversation is, is not is not resulting with, is not getting with a lot of results. So I feel that outreach is a very important component of, of the job that you guys have to do. Uh, additionally, I think incentives wouldn't hurt. Uh, I think 2025 is, is a bit long, uh, and if you want people to, to expedite faster, you might want to consider some type of incentives and uh, on, you know, quick, for a quicker adoption. Thank you. Oh, thank you, and congratulations. Looking forward to seeing that building built. So I'll say to this panel, as I said to the others, I definitely appreciate your deliberations and your time in coming here and crafting good testimony and crafting ideas and critiques and ways we can make these bills better. And we will continue to engage with you. This is not over. We are not passing these bills tomorrow, but we are looking to move them quickly. So we will engage everyone, all stakeholders in the administration to get this right. And um, move it along. So thank you for your time and being here this afternoon. All right, seeing no other, uh, no one else looking to testify, I definitely appreciate you all being here today. As we said earlier, the, Washington has abandoned us and uh, we are going to continue to lead. So it will, whether it's a stretch energy code or, or finding ways to accelerate green projects, we will continue to do so. So uh, we will adjourn this meeting, but we will uh, definitely look forward to continuing our conversation with the administration, with all of the stakeholders here today to get this right. I want to thank Samara Swanson, our staff attorney, uh, Bill Murray, our policy analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, our financial analyst, and my staff, Nick Wazowski, and I see Ezra, my intern here as well. Thank you all for your assistance. And with that, we will gavel this meeting of the Environmental Protection Committee closed.